How's everybody? Same, same, same. Is anyone else ready for the month of February to be over? I am with you. I mean, even as an eternal optimist, it has been a month. Good night. On Thursday, February 2nd, I noticed a rash and some swelling on my forehead. I thought, well, no big deal. It'll go away. I'm an optimist. And so the next day was Friday. I was working that day. Uh, during my lunch break, I went to the Target right here because I thought I had an acne breakout. I was like, I haven't bought acne medicine in 30 years, but let's go for it. So I go over to Target. I get the watch, I get the cream, I ring it home, and Shauna's like, Ben, that is not acne. I was like, ah, well, what could it be? I see a doctor a couple days later. The doctor lets me know from all that he can tell I've had a severe allergic reaction. I was like, well, I could have told my, yeah, that, I'm with you. He's like, have you eaten anything abnormal? It's like, no. You been around anything? No. So he gives me steroids for my severe allergic reaction. And a couple days later, that doctor lets me know, just kidding, you do not have a severe allergic reaction. You have shingles. Shingles on your forehead, shingles on your face, shingles in your eyelid. The most painful thing in my entire life. Can I get a witness? Now, see, some of you had it on your side or your back, and none of us knew about it. It's hard to hide it when it's in your eye. The most painful thing, so painful that typically if I got to sleep, the pain alone would wake me up in the night. It was that painful. It was so painful that on February 12th, a day I had been circling along with you for Vision Sunday, this is the day I'm going to lay out the big vision for the future of our church. You're all here, and I'm at home watching online with my dog. Watching you celebrate the amazing 12 years that you've apparently had as a church. (laughs) The next day, I thought I was better, so I went to work. Even bought my wife some Valentine's flowers a day early. But that Thursday on the 16th, I went to an eye doctor for the first time in my life. I know, come on, give me some sympathy pain, those of you who've been going since age four. I went to an eye doctor for the first time in my life. This was an ophthalmologist, and um, she wanted to look, of course, at my eyes. I knew it was, I had shingles in the eyelid, and I had done a lot of research on shingles, a lot of research on shingles, and there's nothing good about going to WebMD for anything. Are you with me? And uh, just, if you want to have a fun afternoon, just uh, uh, Google shingles on the face, but instead of choosing the normal thing, just choose images. That will make for a blast of an afternoon. But I knew that if indeed it did get in your eye, I knew seriously that there was a potential long-term complication of loss of vision. So I knew that. So when I was at the ophthalmologist just, what, 10 days ago now, um, she said, and it didn't take her long, about 30 seconds in, she said, you have shingles in your actual eye. And because of what I had researched, I knew the potential of what was going on and, and what could happen with my eye. My greatest concern physically was no longer about the pain. It was about the potential loss of vision. And um, just so you know how, how bad it was relative to how healthy I've been, and I'm grateful to God for my health. Again, I'd never been to an eye doctor uh, in, in my 45 years of life. Um, I also, for the month of February, uh, I have taken more sick days this month than I've taken in the 12 years combined that I've worked at Epic. So I've been really, really, but you tell me, what are the chances What are the chances that the first Sunday I ever am scheduled to speak and I don't get to speak is the day I'm going to, for the first time ever, share a five-year vision for our church? You tell me, what are the odds that in 600 Sundays, I can't deliver the goods on Vision Sunday? I do want to thank you for praying. All of the prayer, all the encouraging emails, text, and the donuts pulled me through. Mostly the prayer, but the donuts are like, well, if I can't do anything else, but I have an appetite, let's just eat as much bread and sweet stuff as we can. Thankfully, this past Thursday, that same ophthalmologist let me know that I no longer have shingles in my eye. Let, yeah, I was excited. She let me know there was no more inflammation in my eye, and I don't know how they do with all the big machines, but um, they took a picture of the back of my eye and all the connections. It appears that I will have no complications and suffer long-term loss of vision. 
So thanks be to God. Thanks be to you for praying, those of you watching. But I've got to tell you, what became my greatest physical concern is also the concern I'm carrying with me today for Vision Sunday. And here it is. My greatest concern for my life, for your life, and for our church is that we will experience a loss of vision. That we will forget our why. That we will forget what's possible. That we will settle for something less than what God has actually created us for and is inviting us into. And if you want to have a healthy fear, you should fear for your life a loss of vision. You, you should. Let me say it this way. It is possible to lose the vision for your life, and it is possible for us to lose the vision for our church. Do you know that? To lose the reason, to lose the why. Let me tell you what leads to loss of vision in your life and can lead to loss of vision for our church. Distractions, delays, disappointments, difficult seasons, Busyness can lead to the loss of vision. And did you know that past success can actually cause us to lose our vision for the future? Because we've had enough success that we, don't, we have some things to lose now, and so we just kind of coast and take it easy, right? If you've had a successful marriage, you start coasting if you're not careful. If you've had a successful career, you start coasting. When we think about all that God has done over the last 12 years, it could be easy for us to go, wow, we've seen so much. Let's just kind of exist from here moving forward. And I am so thankful. I am leading the way with gratitude for all God has done over these 12 years. We have seen miracles, facilities, impact, marriages restored, 302 baptisms in 12 years. We've given $2.88 million to the Hope Project, to our partners locally, nationally, and globally. We have seen all kinds of impact. And yet today is not simply a day. Apparently, you guys always celebrated the 12 years on the 12th. I missed that one. But I'm here to talk about the future. Today is Vision Sunday. A vision is a picture of a preferred future. A vision means that we're believing for this, and this is what we're going after. And I think it's important today that we do look not just at the next 12 months, but really at the next 60 months. I have never given a five-year vision till this moment. And here's why I think it's important that we do a five-year vision. I, I, I just really, and by the way, I'm talking about January 1st, 2023 through December 31st, 2027, just to be clear. And the reason for a five-year vision, I believe, is that after the last few years, we need something compelling enough to lead us out of where we've been. Would you agree? I think so many of us, we need to be led out of a life paralyzed by fear, and we need to be led out of a life where we think settling for the status quo is as good as it's going to get. By the way, when we started Epic, in case you just don't know, we weren't looking for just a cool name, but we wanted one that had meaning. And one of the, one of the definitions we found for Epic is this. It's be something that's beyond the ordinary or status quo. And I'm here to tell you that I am as committed to that vision as I've ever been before. And just so you want to know where I'm at, guys, I am not interested in doing maintenance mode for the next five years. You are crazy to pay what you're paying in rent or your mortgage if you're here for maintenance mode. Amen. I want to see a movement. I want to be part of a movement. I want to pray into a movement and give into a movement and lead into a movement and serve into a movement. And I want to go shoulder to shoulder with you. But if you're part of the group that's going after maintenance, please go find another church because we want to see a movement. We want a movement. I want to see it in my lifetime. I want to see God do what they said couldn't be done. Anybody else? But to see a compelling vision actually come to fruition, there's something that has to be present. And so here's what we're after today. I want to show you what has to be present. I, I want to tell you seven specific things that we are aiming at with this five-year vision. And then I'm going to invite you in to take ownership of the vision. Are you with me? Our text for today is Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 32. You can go ahead and find your place there. Let me tell you what's happened in Hebrews so far. And then we'll walk into this text and we'll go for it. The writer of Hebrews is writing to Jewish Christians in the first century, and here's his theme. Jesus is better than everything, and Jesus is better than everyone. And he spends so much of the book urging those first century Jewish Christians, don't abandon your faith in Jesus. In other words, don't lose the vision. And then he gets to the middle of chapter 10, and let me just give you five imperatives, and then we'll walk into 32. Here are the five imperatives he gives midway, at least some of them. He says this. Draw near to God, draw near to God, 
Hold on to the hope you profess. Listen, stir one another up towards love and good deeds, right? That's how we go after our vision collectively as a community. And, and then he says, don't stop meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And we're like, listen, Mr. Writer of Hebrews, we couldn't do that for 68 weeks. And then he says, stop sinning. And here comes 32. Would you stand with me as I read Hebrews 10, 32 through 11, 2? And let's see if we can find the ingredient that I'm referring to. It has a couple of different names. So here we go. Verse 32. The writer writes, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And, but my righteous one will live by faith and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. Just hear that again. God takes no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. Verse 39, but we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Chapter 11, now faith is confidence in what we hope for, assurance about what we do not see. This, this, this is what the ancients were commended for. And friends, look at me. This is what we will or won't be commended for as well. Have a seat. Let's talk through this ingredient. We've been through a lot the last few years. Can I get a witness? Yeah. Like you guys have, you would agree. We've been through a lot in our world and in your world. I'm sure you've been through a lot the last three years. But almost none of us have been through what this first century group has been through. Would you agree? What have they been through? They, conflict, suffering. Uh, they have uh, public insult persecution. They've been imprisoned and, and their property has been confiscated. But notice the adverb that is used there by the writer. He's trying to recall what they've seen God do and the kind of faith and confidence and trust they've had in God. And he says, you guys joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. I mean, if you touch my candy bar, we're fighting. They joyfully accepted the confiscation of their property. I mean, how do you do that? What would have to be true in your heart, in your mind, to joyfully accept? The, and you're like, Ben, is that where we're going today? You're taking our property? I mean, I will, but no. I want to give you a principle. And why you're going to think, Ben, we're not facing what they were facing. It hasn't gotten that bad. I agree. But the principle that they just gave us in this text, I want to give you for your life as well. It is easier to give up temporary things. If you know you have better and lasting possessions, you will never give up. Let me ask you, and I'm guilty of it too. Why do we cling so tightly to the things we will have to give up one day and we let go of the thing that we will never have to let go of? That's a word just for somebody right now. Even before you hear the vision of Epic Church, you just know that's the word for you today. You have let go of the thing that will take you from here into eternity, and you're clenching so tightly to the thing that you will have to give up one day. And I want to ask you, when you have to give all that up one day, what will you have left? Verse 35, there's a great line. He says, do not throw away your confidence. Do not throw away your confidence. I love that. He's trying to build up their confidence. I think confidence, you can say it, faith or trust. Like this is the ingredient that must be necessary to see a God-sized vision come to fruition. Don't throw away your confidence. Let me ask you a question I already know the answer to, but I'm going to see who's participating. Have you ever thrown away your confidence? Have you ever been in that space where your confidence was so high, but you ran into something and it blew your confidence up? Let me tell you about a season when my confidence was so high. November of 2019, we launched this thing called the Home Initiative. And if you weren't here, hundreds of people at Epic, we gave just right at just below $7 million in commitments that we would set aside for our future real estate as a church. You're like, Ben, what, what, what was the address? We didn't know. Then when were you guys going to do this? We didn't know. 
But there was so much faith and confidence present. Do you remember that church, those of you who are here? It was incredible. And just two months after that, the confidence was still high. January of 2020, I know it was 20 years ago, but January of 2020, we averaged more people at Epic on Sundays than any month in our history. On average, not one time, on average for the month of January 2020, an average of 768 humans showed up here every Sunday over three services. Incredible. And we were believing 7 million in commitment, reaching more people in our city than we've ever reached before. Things were being birthed. We were doing the sacred vocation workshops. Stuff was, it was just happening. And then five weeks later, we began the process, many of us, of throwing away our confidence. We realized we could no longer have confidence in our plans. We could not even have confidence in meeting together. We could not even have confidence in what we knew was certain before March of 2020. And so many of us, if we're honest, threw away our confidence in God. We just didn't know if we could do it. Today, I want to urge you to get your confidence back. And you're like, Ben, well, you're going to give us something to do this afternoon or tonight or a new Bible study? I think all that can be great, but no, I want to ask for it right now. Would you guys just join me in a quick prayer? And you can make this prayer your own. God, would you give us back our individual and collective confidence? Here's a key preposition, in you. God, give us back our confidence in you right now. God, I don't want to wait till we go out the doors. I don't want to wait till we have to process it. By the Spirit of God, would you restore confidence right now? Would you restore confidence right now? God, would you do it in the person who's thinking about walking away from their faith? Will you do it in the person who's been laid off and they're not sure you still have a vocation in their future? God, would you do it for the person whose child is far away from you and they have dropped their confidence because the prayer didn't work, at least over the last year? God, would you give us confidence back in you that you have us, that we're in your good hands and you can be trusted? Amen. He says, don't throw away your confidence because you will be richly rewarded. And the reason you and I should keep our confidence, regardless of what comes, God is faithful. And if we persevere, there's a reward at the end of that. And I don't want to lose the reward. And I don't want you to lose the reward. And then in verse 39, he introduces us to two groups. And friends, I think these two groups are always present. There's a group that shrinks back, and there's another one that has faith. So I want to ask us, will we be in the shrinking back or having faith group? And I know what you want. Some of you are like, Ben, I just like staying in the middle. Well, let's pretend that this line that you can't see on the stage, let's pretend like it's the middle. So, and I'm telling you, you've got to either shrink back or move forward. And you're like, Ben, I'm just going to hold my ground. You, you're not just going to hold your ground because if God is calling us to move forward and you are still at the same place, you have shrunk back. Right? If God calls me to move forward in my generosity and I keep giving the same amount of money, I've shrunk back if I stay at the same place. If God calls me to a greater level of prayer and I keep praying like I've been praying, I've shrunk back. Are you with me? Church, can I just ask you, please, don't shrink back. Here's why there's too much at stake. There's too many people at stake in our city. There's too many marriages. There's too many children. There's too many families at stake. And here's another reason why you shouldn't shrink back. You have the spirit of the living God in you. Why in the world would you and I shrink back? He can do anything. He can overcome anything. Dead people find life. Blind people find sight. Deaf people find hearing. I mean, this is the God we claim to say is real. And he says he's in us. And if that's true, it is time to stop shrinking back and let's move forward. And he says in verse 1 of chapter 11, here's what faith is. Faith is confidence in what we hope for, but it's assurance about what we do not. Okay, if you want to know if you have vision for any area of your life or if we have it for our church, here's the question we have to be able to answer. Are you able to see what you cannot see yet? If the answer is no, you don't have vision, but you also don't have faith. Are you able to see what you cannot see yet? Do you know this church never would have came into existence unless there was a group of us who were able to see what we could not see yet? That home initiative thing we just talked about, that was the perfect exercise in seeing what we could not see yet. Can you see what you cannot see yet for your life? for your marriage, for your kids. Any parents out there that need to, by faith, be able to see things that you can't see with these eyes? Shauna and I are like, hmm. Faith, Shauna, faith, faith. Not just physical eyes, eyes of faith. Can you see for your vocation, your career, what you cannot see yet? Church, will we see for our church and for our city what we cannot actually see yet? Guys, we walk by faith, not by sight. And has that been challenged over the last few years? 
I have to train myself to see in a new way. Because when I walk the neighborhood that God's had our church in for all 12 years and where he's got us for the foreseeable future, I'm like, God, is anybody going to be here besides us? Eyes of faith. And then in verse 2 of chapter 11, he writes, this is what the ancients were commended for. The ancients were not commended for their intellect or their accomplishments or their beauty or their relational network. Listen, the ancients weren't even commended for their spiritual gifts. What were they commended for? Faith, trust, confidence that there was a God who could do and would do what was humanly impossible. You know what you don't need in a pastor or a church? For me to tell you to go do what's humanly possible. You've got that one nailed down, right? Anybody out there besides me? I'm crushing what's humanly possible. But I want in on the impossible. I want to live in the reality of the promise of Jesus who said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Let's live in the possibility. But to live in the possibility, you've got to know a couple of things. Opposition is coming for us. Do you know that? Again, think it's an accident. And I realized today, I'm like sharing a big vision for the next five years of our church. And if you're cynical, anybody found cynicism the last three years? Don't raise your hand to that. We're going to root that out in the name of Jesus. But if you're cynical, you're like, huh, this guy's going to give us a five-year vision when he couldn't even show up on the day he told us he was going to give us the vision? I'm not sure I'm down with that. You better believe it. We're not going to be deterred. We're not going to lay down. We're not going to give up. We're not going to walk away. We're not going to stop praying even when we haven't seen it yet. You really have to hang on to that word yet. I haven't seen it yet. I just haven't seen it yet. I just haven't seen it yet. But we've got to hold our confidence. Now, let me give you a a confidence playbook. You could go a lot of places in Scripture, but let me give you Psalm 27. Anybody found confidence in Psalm 27? The whole thing's amazing. I want to give you the first three verses and the last two, but when you're looking for confidence... Let me just encourage you, this Hebrews text is great, but Psalm 27 has been such a companion to me. Here's what it says in the first three verses. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. And I love verse three. Listen, though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. You're like, then what word should I circle? Because I'm doing that in my Bible. I'm underlining, I'm highlighting. Let me, there's a lot there, but I would actually circle or underline those two words, even then. Even then. And you fill in the blank where he's got army and war. Fill in the blank with whatever the thing is that's going to besiege you or break out against you. When layoffs besiege me, I will not fear. When the girl walks out of our dating relationship, I will not fear. Those shingles break out against me. Come on, can I get a witness? I will still be confident even then. You guys, we have to have a confidence that doesn't rise and fall with the stock market. Like we have to, if you've been tr- checking that out. Like have to. We've got to have a confidence that doesn't fall or rise with whether or not we got the dopamine hit that we look for. We have to have a confidence that doesn't rise and fall with our children's behaviors or the weather or anything else. I've got to put my confidence in a God who's got me no matter what comes against me. And then the last two verses of Psalm 27 are these. It's about keeping your confidence. Here's what he says. I remain confident of this. I remain confident of this. Here's what I know. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And then he gives this not passive waiting exercise, but an active waiting exercise. And he says, wait for the Lord. Not passively, though. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Will you get your confidence back in God today? I pray by the Spirit of God it will come to you if it hasn't already. Now I want to share seven specific things but I'm encouraging and urging us to be confident that God will do in our church over the next five years. Now, let me say a couple things. Number one, I don't want any emails like, Ben, why are we only doing seven things the next five years? We're going to do a lot of things, but I'm just going to let you know, here, here are the seven things we're really honing in on. Here's the first one. Open up our future home at 414 Brandon Street. Remember, this is a five-year vision. Oh, my gosh. I love our city. I love all the policies. I'm like, nobody else is even in the neighborhood. You should be paying us to be here. 
but there's this permit process, and there's testing, and there's all the things. And um, yeah, but let me tell you about our future home. We, we're going to be stakeholders in the city. We, we really al- already are in some ways. And um, God has provided us a space. And here's the word. I've shared this at prayer night. It just keeps coming to my heart and my mind. The word is beacon, that 414 Brandon Street would really be a beacon. And, like, I knew what that word was, but, like, God, what exactly does that mean? Let me give you a definition that we're, we're, we're working out here for beacon. A fire or light set up in a prominent position as a signal or celebration, a lighthouse or other signal for guidance. Here's what we know about 414. It is going to be uh, allowing us to be more visible than we've ever been as a church. I mean, if God can do this in a hidden alley, amen, if God can rock this in a basement, (laughs) again, our hope isn't in the building, even though we are moving on up, as one of my favorite shows, The Jeffersons, used to sing. God's giving us an opportunity to be a greater beacon for Soma, for the city of San Francisco, for the Bay Area, and from here to the world. And I love that. Think about that, a signal for celebration and a signal for guidance. What if, not just in our community, but 414 Brandon Street and specifically the Epic Church community became known as a place like, hey, I don't necessarily believe what those people believe, but celebration and joy breaks out there all the time. And if you need guidance for anything in your life, that's a place to go. You need spiritual guidance, get to 414 Brandon. You need relational guidance, you need vocational guidance, you need financial guidance. You, there's, there's guidance and there's celebration. What if that became the beacon represented by 414 Brandon Street? Second thing we want to see, we want to see us baptizing 200 people over the next five years. Like, Ben, where are we? Again, I said this in the intro, but we baptized 302 people over the first 12 years, so this would be accelerating that significantly. Um, we are f- f- four in already, so just 196 to go. We have baptism next Sunday. People are already scheduled for it, and I know many of you, that's your next step. And so, hey, you can actually take that step and help yourself complete the vision that God's given to us. Third one is this. We want to write songs and record worship albums over the next five years. We love how God has been building a growing, passionate worship culture here at Epic, and we want to see more of that. And here's why. Every human heart in our city, all 800,000 of them, they are worshiping something, and we know they were created to worship God, and we want to aid them in doing that. And part of the reason we're able to do this and set our sights on that is because God has given us Seth and Jess Condry. Jess really is probably the brains behind all that Seth's doing. But aren't you grateful to have a worship pastor and a songwriter that has the gifts that Seth has? And the vision really is that there will be songs written in our house for our house that bless the world. In fact, everything I'm sharing on the vision is something that starts at Epic, but all of it goes to bless others. Don't you love that? When when that came to me, I was like, oh, wow, guys, look. And I told the staff months ago, hey, look, all seven of these things, they're going to bless our community, but all of them are going to go out from our community. Because when a movement of God happens, there are always new songs that accompany that movement. You see this all through the scripture, don't you? Sing a new song. No pressure. Zero pressure. But Seth has been writing songs for a long time. He's been writing songs since he stepped foot off the plane here in San Francisco three years ago. And he's been writing songs in this current season and already started to record those. So pray. You can invest in that. You'll, figure out how to, you'll see how to do that. We've got some of the most gifted people that he's connected to helping us put those out. And so just stay tuned. Be praying and get a chance to invest in that whenever that opportunity arises. Uh, the, the fourth thing we want to see is doubling the number of kids and students here at Epic on Sundays. Guys, if you don't have a vision for the next generation, you do not have a vision, period. And we know what they say about how hard it is to do family life in San Francisco. And we know that that's true, don't we? But we also know that we have a God who is in us and leading us. So one of our values here at Epic is that families thrive. I love how Shauna and her organization talk about this. They don't call them the next generation. They call them the now generation. The now generation. We're not waiting for next. We're doing it now. Love that. And when we think next generation, we're not just talking about, yes, of course, babies and toddlers and elementary age kids and middle schoolers and high schoolers that are meeting behind that wall right now. We're talking about college students. Do you know we have more college students in our church than ever before? My friend Christine Wu and others are leading that group. And it's just been cool what God has done Um, to bring college students. And we're talking about all of you beautiful young adults. Raise your hand if you consider yourself a young adult. I'm with you. Like, no, come, come, raise it. No, I'm I'm not, this is not for telling you what to do. I'm just doing it with you. It's amazing. It's amazing um, how many people in their, you know, 20s, uh, low 30s, wherever you count that cutoff. How many of you, how many of you, how many of you God has brought here? It is a deep desire in my heart 
to pour myself out for the next generation, but also for the generation older than me and beyond. Aren't you grateful? Aren't you grateful that we have a multi-generational, multicultural church here at Epic? I mean, this is one of the most beautiful. Just look around. Don't guess people's ages and don't hold up fingers like I'm. Like, <laughs> but just look around. Seriously, take a look. It's crazy. It's crazy. Even as kids and students are meeting right now, it's pretty wild. It's pretty amazing. The fifth one is probably the biggest stretch goal that I'm sharing today. By 2027, we want to be able to give away a million dollars to the Hope Project annually. Annually. Like, Ben, where are we at on that? 2021 was the most we've ever given to the Hope Project. By the way, the Hope Project funds our local, national, and global partners. Uh, We launch at the second Sunday of November. You can give to it year-round, but we do an intense focus giving season um, halfway through November towards and and through the end of the year. Um, So we've given 519,000. That was our greatest year. That was 2021. Um, One thing really cool to know, if you don't know, um, your companies, and many tons of you do this, which is beautiful in making up that goal, um, your companies usually won't match your giving to our regular budget. In fact, that almost never happens, but most of your companies um, will allow... your match to the Hope Project. So, um, well, just tell me. I know I'm shooting just off the cuff here, but just in matching alone, your companies propelled the vision of the Hope Project by how much last year? About $100,000 over the last two years. Each year, just kidding. Over $100,000 each of the last two years, so it's incredible, and uh, he can tell you more about that, but it's amazing that the companies you work for that may not be that interested in Jesus are helping us bring Jesus to other places. That's all I'll say about that. Um, the sixth one is we want to see 100 people reached attending Alpha every single session. Alpha is this beautiful tool that introduces people to Jesus and the claims of Christianity. And it's the ideal environment for people being introduced to who are exploring faith in Jesus, um, starting their faith in Jesus, or coming back to their faith in Jesus. And right now on Tuesday nights uh, and on Wednesdays, we have 58 people, including leaders, that are part of Alpha for this session. The seventh specific thing we want to do, and the final one that I'm sharing today, is we want to open a center for sacred vocation. This is one of the unique callings God has given to our church to prioritize and speak into the intersection of faith and work. You're like, Ben, what would that even look like? Well, let me tell you where we've been on this. We've done teaching series on sacred vocation. Uh, We have done lots of workshops. We've done events. Right now, this past September, we launched a nine-month vocational leadership cohort called Awaken, and nearly 20 men and women are gathering every month. They're exploring leaders of the scriptures. They're exploring a variety of assessments. How did God make them? They're in community with each other. Um, that's been on the hush-hush. It was an invite-only thing for this first one. And uh, these two are here, but Atul Diggy and Minnie Lee have been providing incredible leadership to the Awaken community. And it's obviously not private anymore, so we'll let you know um, how you can apply to be part of those cohorts moving forward. Um, We also love entrepreneurs here at Epic. We know where God's put us and what is on our heart. We have an event for entrepreneurs on March the 8th. It's just about sold out. If it's not, it doesn't cost anything. It's just there was a cap of 50 people, and I know we're over 40 uh, as of yesterday at least. Um, So if you want to join us, our own Jasmine Lawrence and Ben Chuff will be sharing about their entrepreneurial journey and how it goes with their faith in Jesus. And we want to help you connect, and let's start birthing some new dreams together as entrepreneurs. That's what we're going for. We also want to train people around the world with what God has unlocked for us in this sacred vocation space. And in case you're wondering, Ben, why so much emphasis on vocation? Listen, you'll spend a couple of hours with us on a Sunday, but we are interested in the full 168 hours of your week. And most of those hours will be spent in some kind of work outside of sleeping. We know that, and we want to invest in that. But we've got a group going to our partner church in Chile, In April, they're going to be putting on a sacred vocation conference, so you can be praying for them and know that those opportunities will be present moving forward. Can you guys get behind that vision? Every one of those is going to have massive implications for people who don't know Jesus yet, for kids and students, right? For people to be singing a new song that comes out of this movement, to open a center for sacred vocation. And what we know is that it's going to take a few things for this to come to fruition. The first thing it's going to take is the favor of God. If you don't know, Epic Church was built on this verse, Psalm 127, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, and of course we think the city of San Francisco, the guards stand watch in vain. You don't want to do things in vain, do you? 
well, let's take our hand off of the stuff that God's not touching. And let's put our hand and our heart and our prayer and our life and our feet into the things that God's touching. So if you build what God is not building, you're doing it in vain. But let me tell you what's not in vain. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 58. I love this and how these two go together. Paul writes, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain. What is he saying when it says stand firm? He's saying don't lose the vision. Don't lose your faith. Don't lose your trust. Don't lose your confidence. Don't, don't, don't lose your commitment. Because any work you do that is the Lord's work will never be done in vain. But there's a word there that is meant to challenge a number of us in this room. And it's the word fully. A lot of you have been a foot in and a foot out, and that doesn't get after the vision. A lot of us have been leaving our options open when God's calling us to greater commitment, and that's never going to fulfill a God-sized vision. A lot of us want to see God do those things without having to pay a price, but every great vision has required a price to be paid. And the question I have for us, Epic Church, is will we give ourselves fully to this vision? I want to tell you what that means. I'm going to have our team pass out a couple of cards to you. You guys can go ahead and do that if you don't mind. What you're getting is a card that looks like this, Vision Sunday. It says February 12th. Just scratch that out. Put 26. And there are seven things on the back that I just shared with you. I want, these, are, these are yours to keep. You're going to get two things. I'll tell you about the second one in just a moment. Would you make this something that you pray through at a, on at least a weekly basis over the next five years? Would you just be praying about this? This is yours to keep. It's a way you can hold, you know, if you're like, yeah, Ben, we're going to hold you accountable. Listen, I'm just one person in this community. I'm going to hold you accountable. But I'm going to give you four ways you can make a commitment to this vision. You'll see that on the smaller card. Let me give those to you. I know you're looking at it. I'm cool with that. But let's walk through this card. The first one says, I will seek to orient my entire life around Jesus. You guys know we're not getting off center from that vision, right? The vision of Epic Church is to see an increasing number of people in San Francisco orient their entire lives around Jesus. Will you seek to orient your entire life around Jesus? Like, Ben, what does that mean? Here's what it means. In every part of your life, you ask the question, if I'm following Jesus in this area, what will that lead to? You ask it of your time. You ask it of your vocation. You ask it of your mind. You ask it of your money. You ask it of your body. Do you get the point? We don't get to pick and choose when and where we're going to follow Jesus. Second thing, I will be all in on this vision, which at least will include praying, being part of a group, serving on a team, and inviting others. Three and four, we're going to get up the ante a little bit. The third one says, I will prayerfully consider staying in the San Francisco Bay Area for the next five years. But Ben, what if God calls me somewhere else to go somewhere else? But you, what if you start praying for God to let you stay? Why don't you start asking for a calling? Why don't you start asking for a vision? Why don't you start asking for provision so that you can stay? And if you just need a default answer, why can't the default just be staying rather than the default that it's been for so many people over the years just be going? And again, if God calls me somewhere else, I'm out. My own kids, all of them will either be <laughs> in college or out of college within these five years. They don't anticipate going to college here. That's cool. I want them to be wherever God wants them to be. But it's going to take a bunch of us deciding to stay here for some length of time so we can see a movement. And then the fifth one is I will help fuel this vision through my generosity. Now, listen, there's a white space on the, black, on the back for those of you who, you know, just want to write in your own answer. But we gave you three choices, and here's why. Let me, let me just be clear. The first one says $30 a month giving. You're like, Ben, that's not very generous. You're right. But what all of us need is to take a next step where we are. So if you've never given anything, I think that's a great entry point. Just start. For those of you who have started, so you're down the journey, I want to encourage you towards what the Bible calls a tithe. I know, it's threshold giving. I know, it's costly. I'm in. And the third one is this kingdom builder category. I invite you to give above and beyond 10%. 
Now, not as your pastor telling you stories, but I just want to tell you my own journey of generosity. I won't tell specifics. I'll just tell a couple of things. Over a decade ago, I began to take the over and above 10% journey in my own life. Let me just tell you, would you like to know what I've learned along the way? Let me just give you three things. I could, I could give you more, and I've got lots of friends in this room who could stand up and do the same. First thing I learned is that God will still take care of me. Isn't it crazy that we think when we start trusting God more, he's going to provide for us less? I found the opposite to be true. The second thing it's done is it's built my faith. I told you I've got four that are going to be in college and out of college in the next five years. Are you with me? I've even had a mentor, I'm not going to name him, encourage me to kind of pull back on my generosity for the season. And if I have to do that, I'm, I'm open to whatever needs to happen. But I'm grateful that not only have we not pulled back, we've accelerated it. And the third thing I've learned is this. I love getting to invest in incredible kingdom ventures. I love helping people bring babies home for adoption. I love giving to the Hope Project out of that excess. I love giving to the Home Initiative out of that excess. I love that my kids are seeing it up close and personal. Hey, our family is going above and beyond because we trust God and we want to be a part of what God's doing. And if that's you, and I realize it won't be for all of us, maybe not even most of us, but I invite you into that. As I ask the band to come back up, I want to do an exercise. I want you to close your eyes, and it's not going to be something you haven't heard, but it's going to be asking you to do something with what you've heard in a different way. And and you'll have a chance to turn that card in. Here's what I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine those things I just told you about, but I want you to really get it full color in your mind. I want you to imagine people. I want you to imagine sights. I want you to imagine sounds. And I want you to imagine the joy that you might experience. So just picture first the grand opening at 414 Brandon Street. Picture your neighbors coming that day. Picture more space. Picture what God's going to do with that. Picture marriages being restored. Picture healing. Picture worship. Imagine the sound that's going to emanate from that building. Then imagine 100 people showing up on Tuesday nights or other nights to hear about who this Jesus is and explore his claims. Imagine many of them and many others being part of that 200 group that are going to be baptized over the next five years. What does that do to your heart? Imagine new songs coming from our house for our house, but blessing the world beyond. Imagine the number of kids and students doubling over these five years. Them understanding God created them. He's got a purpose. He sent Jesus for them, and he wants to use their lives for great purposes. Imagine us opening a center for sacred vocation where, from a very young age, everyone who is part of that understands God created them and called them into things. And we're going to help them get jobs, help them be developed, help them become leaders, help them understand what the thing they do Monday through Friday has to do with their faith in Jesus. And then imagine all of the individuals, churches, organizations, and cities and communities on the other side of us giving a million dollars annually. What kind of joy would that bring to you? Now I want you to look at me before we respond. This is really important, what I'm about to say. It's it's as important as everything I've said. Please look at me. If you don't do any of the things we're asking our church to do today, there's still a place for you here at Epic. Do you know that? Guys, listen, you can attend and be part of what we're doing here without ever giving, without ever being in a group, without ever serving, without even staying in the city for the next five years. You know you can do that, right? You know you can do it because a lot of you have, right? Right? But for you to be able to sit and receive something you're not contributing to, everybody else, there's got to be a bunch of us who will pay it forward for the people who aren't ready to commit yet. Are you with me? And the reason every person could step into this church is because there was always a group paying it forward. There was always a group of people. It started with 13 of us moving out here to start this church, and then there was 130, and then there were 200, and it just continued to go. But there's always been a group of people. And what I'm asking you to do, if you would be willing to, is to pray about being part of this commitment. Pray about being part of this vision. I wanna ask you to stand. This altar is open and let me give you a few prayer prompts and then we're gonna sing a song of worship. Maybe the prayer you should pray during this time is like, man, God, some of this doesn't even sit well with me. I I don't wanna be here for five years. I don't wanna be generous. 
But God, would you open my heart to whatever it is you want me to do to be part of this? Some of you have been looking for a new church and you're wondering if Epic is it. Well, we've put all of our cards on the table today. You know what we're going after. And if you decide that's not for you, there are lots of great churches in our city. Thirdly, though, I know so many of you are with us. You've told us so. You've shown us so. Would you just pick one or two things off that list of seven and pray specifically for that now? And would you also make yourself available to God? Like, God, I want to be used for this next generation, or I want to be used with the baptism thing, or I want to be used for this um, uh, Hope Project piece. Whatever it is that resonates deeply with you, would you just begin to pray it? Guys, if we don't have confidence that God can do what we've said, then this will just been, have been an inspired message that we do nothing with. But I don't believe God's given us a vision to do nothing. I believe he's given us a vision to do something. And I want you to know this from the bottom of my heart. I love you, and I think what Jesus has ahead for us is worth it. Will you join me in that as we worship now?